Welcome to our weekly compilation. From the hilarious and heartwarming to the downright bizarre, we've got it all covered. Whether you're a longtime viewer or new to the platform, there's always something fresh and exciting for you here. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss a moment of our funniest videos. Escape Room Employees, what was the weirdest escape tactic you have seen? Story 1. I was in a room in Dallas where it was a different type of escape room. You break into a bank vault and you have hundreds of lockboxes on the wall. Each has its own escape room puzzle, and the more you get, the more money you escape with. Also in the corner is an old style safe. I went with a group and we were cranking out lockboxes left and right. One of my friends, Eagle Scout, decided to just try the old school style of lis listening on the old safe to get it to work. We spent 15 minutes breaking into the vault, 40 minutes of doing lockboxes, and 5 minutes planting the dynamite and escaping. His entire time was breaking into that one safe. Madness. He ended up doing it and we beat the record by over a mil because no one had ever done the safe. Hey, I know this place. I'm actually the owner over there, if it's the one I'm thinking of, and I definitely remember you guys. Nobody else ever ended up picking the lock, and we removed it from the room before we ended up retiring the entire experience. Okay, so like, A, I think escape rooms are super cool. I've never actually gotten to do one, sadly. Um, but B... Now, I don't know if normal escape rooms will, will ever do it for me, because now I know about bank heist, or not even heist, just breaking into a bank, bank robbery escape room. How is that not the only kind of escape room now? Like, I, I genuinely need to find one of these near me, because that sounds amazing. Story 2. Just a funny experience. We did an escape room where you have to figure out which employee committed a crime, and it used pictures of the actual employees. They also give you whiteboards to write down clues. I saw a guy on the wall named Matt, so I drew him very crudely on the whiteboard with a giant arrow saying he did it. <laughs> I forgot about it. 20 minutes later, and we can't figure it out, so an employee is supposed to come retrieve you, and the person who walks in is frickin' Matt. Come to find out Matt is the owner, but we never saw him while we did prior escape rooms. Dude walks in and stands right next to my crappy drawing of him. I was praying to God he didn't turn to his right. He explained that we lost and told us the criminal was him all along. He left without seeing my drawing, and I erased it fast as heck. I technically won since I called it Matt from the beginning, so... Story 3. Late to the post, but hope you all get a chuckle out of it. We had a bachelor party come through, quite drunk. We're having a good time, taking their pictures, and generally just shooting the crap as everyone gets ready. They start the room and immediately start finishing all of our puzzles in record time. Turns out one is a welder, another is an electrical engineer, and one is the owner of a home contracting company. Each one was calling out every part of the room that was fake. I've seen this electronic lock before, it needs a four-digit code. Or, yeah, that's a fake well, this pipe does something, etc. It was hilarious because they're drunk, but just absolutely blasting through our room. They still hold the old-time record which no other team has ever come close to. Great guys. You know, honestly, I think a number of these stories are going to do with, like, people, like, breaking stuff in escape rooms or, like, basically cheating. But this is just kind of cool. Like, I don't know. I think if I was running an escape room, like, if people were cheating, I'd be like, why? Why would you ever do an escape room and cheat? You gave me money to deprive yourself of an experience? That's That makes no sense. But for these folks, the way that they did it, you know, just with their life skills and applying it here, I don't know, I'd be impressed. <laughs> Story 4. I recently went to an escape room where we had a brief before we went in. The employee there told us that some people start ripping up furniture and pulling bricks out of the walls, and that you're not supposed to do that i.e. everything you can use will be movable slash visible in the room. If you feel the need to rip open a mattress in the room, you're doing it wrong. We had a similar briefing. She told us, the wires going into the walls are supposed to stay in the walls. Please do not rip up the carpets. There is nothing under it but the floor. Please do not remove ceiling tiles and crawl into the ceiling. Everything you need will be in the room easily movable. If it doesn't move, it's not meant to. Story 5. Had a friend who ran an escape room in an old house. She said she had a group that snuck in tools and disassembled the furniture looking for clues, namely a metal child's bed and rocker. 
She had another group that peeled off a layer of wallpaper and punched a hole through the drywall. I also went through with a friend who tore a stuffed animal in half to remove it from a lockbox instead of finding the key. I feel like some people that do escape rooms don't realize that other people have to do the puzzles. So if the solution was punching a hole in a wall or just breaking anything in general, that the next group could not also break said already broken item. This is, there is no way that could be the solution. Story 6. A friend of mine runs an escape room and told me this story. A group was in a room that just so happened to have a drop ceiling. You know, the ones with the tiles you can lift up on and I guess you go inside if you need to? Well, that's what this group decided to do. The employee kept hearing weird thumps and bumps, so we went in to check on everything and found two people up inside the ceiling. There was nothing in the ceiling. I've done that room, and there is no indication that you should go into the ceiling. Why would they think that was an okay thing to do? The escape room company has now added, don't go into the ceiling, to their pregame rules slash safety spiel. I mean, if they had kept crawling in the ceiling, eventually they could have escaped by pulling one of the tiles that's above the hallway or lobby. It's stuff like this that makes me feel so bad for people who run escape rooms because I've heard so many stories about people just breaking stuff and doing stupid things and it's like, how long does your little like liability waiver that you have these people sign have to be because it sounds like you're going to be unfurling this gargantuan proclamation of crap that they can't do because it could get you sued or something. Oi, folks, just... Just do them right, have fun, or else they're going to just take all the escape rooms away. Then what will you escape from? Story 7. While doing an escape room, the bottom drawer was locked, and one of the members of our party of randoms was trying a long time to try and open it. The top drawer wasn't locked, so I just pulled it all the way out. Then I reached in the drawer to grab the item. Apparently that's not the solution, but the property owners running the game for us got a kick out of it. I've done the same thing before and got a similar response. I think it's bad room design. Some escape rooms that I've been to modify their drawers to make sure this is impossible if not intended. It feels like a puzzle to me if it's not at least warn us because it's creative navigation of the space, which is really what the whole jam is. Story 8. Not an employee, but I was in a horror escape room in China. There were nine of us in total and we reached a point where we were in a small room together. To advance to the next room, one of the girls, of whom there were three, had to bring an apple to the ghost in the previous room alone. All three girls were scared crapless and refused to leave. Check with the supervisor through the walkie-talkie, definitely has to be a girl to fit with the story. Finally, with no path forward, one of the guys opens the door and yells into the hallway, Can I go if I'm gay? Some discussion ensues on the walkie-talkie about this point, but they eventually relented. Story 9. I've done three escape rooms and I am notoriously bad at them. My shining example was when it was just me and a friend doing the escape her first time. We stunk and didn't escape the room. The employee came in and showed us what clues we had left in order to open the door. It was like five more steps and I thought, well that sucks, but five steps isn't that bad. And then the employee opened the door to show us the other room we were supposed to have gone into after the five steps. This room had even more puzzles to complete, which opened into another room. All in all, we completed like 7% of the puzzles on an escape room that had a 40% success rate. I've come to terms with escape rooms not being my forte. Hey, there's no shame in that. Not everyone is built to, like, basically do this kind of weird fictionalized detective work, whatever you want to call it. Like, I'm sure that you are smart and capable in other areas of life. Um, I just hope that no one is ever trapped in a room with you because, uh, you, well, I mean, maybe they'll be good at it. You better hope they are. Story 10. I've learned not to make the final stage a lock with a key because dang if I haven't met some of the best lock picks in the state. I had a room solve this by saying it only counted if you used the key to unlock it, otherwise they wouldn't count you as escaped. Story 11. My family had an escape room, and there was a room with a phone that connected to three other rooms. The doors only open when you dial the right numbers on the phone, and so my sister just walked up and pressed redial, and the last door opened. We have a record of 7.5 minutes to complete the room. And now they dial a random number before letting in a new group. 
Story 12. Someone honestly believed that throwing himself at the door counts as solving the riddle. Since that fateful day, I tell every group that it is not necessary to throw yourself at doors. Story 13. My brother and I once got out of a room by taking a magnet from the previous puzzle and using it to lift a key out of a small opening in a locked box. There were six of us, and nobody could figure out the last clue, so we improvised. Got out with three minutes to spare. Unlike all the posts about just picking the lock, that actually sounds like it's in the spirit of the room. Uber drivers, what is the most unforgettable conversation you've had to eavesdrop on? Story 1. Not eavesdropping, but the most unforgettable conversation took me to meet Elon Musk, sort of. I was driving back space rocket scientists from a bar that the company bought out for a night in Cape Canaveral. They were there to watch the rocket launch in which the first stage booster would land back at the launch pad after detaching from the main payload capsule. This was their first attempt about six months after their first attempt, which failed in April 2015. While space has been successful with this process a handful of times since then, this particular launch marked the first time in history that a stage first stage booster landed successfully after launching a rocket into outer orbit. ULA did something similar, but this was in low Earth orbit, so science junkies don't count it. I watched the whole thing live, and indeed it was beautiful. And at the end, I figured I'd help taxi around some people. I was sure probably Ubered to the event in the first place. Hundreds were gathered. I usually chat with passengers to help pass the time and maybe learn something new. And I was surprised by the first space engineer I picked up who told me about the bar and how the workers had gathered to watch the launch. After I dropped them off the hotel they were staying at, I figured there'd be more rides and made my way back to their bar and indeed continued to shuttle several more scientists back to their hotel. After my third or fourth ride, one of the scientists said, If you want to see he Elon, he's at the bar too, hanging out. And in my head I was like, oh my god. And so I dropped these guys off and drove back to the bar fast. I walked in right at 2am just as the bartender was starting to close up. I asked the bartender if I could get a drink before looking for Elon, but he appropriately said no. I said alright and turned around and about 15 feet from the bar I saw Elon laughing with four or five of his presumably employees and I stared, gawked really, for a brief moment. As much as I wanted to, I didn't walk up to him because I figured he wouldn't really care for my 21 year old self at the time and that's okay, since still the best night of Uber. I mean, first, I don't think Elon would have truly uh, enjoyed being around a 21-year-old because you were far too old to find his sense of humor that appealing. Ah, I got you, Elon. <laughs> ah, I'm kidding, Elon. What a great success that was for your scientists specifically that night. But hey, you've enjoyed so many successes since then. I mean, look at your episode of SNL. Look what you're doing to Twitter or... <laughs> Should I say X? Ooh. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, it's been a great ride for Elon, the dipstick. <laughs> I, you know, I just, I really wanted a chance to dunk on Elon for a little bit. So I'm glad this story was here to let me vent that out for a little while. <sighs> story two. Okay, so this is a post I've been waiting on for a while. Buckle up, guys. This is a long one. Also, I'm mobile, so I don't have my formatting. Okay, I was driving for Uber a few years ago in Savannah, Georgia, as a side hustle. And one night, I picked up this couple from a bar. For simplicity, I will call them girl and boy, respectively. Both were both drunk and were talking really loud. Boy kicked off the convo by talking about how he ended up in Savannah. And this is where I started to pay attention, because he started to tell this girl that he had enlisted in the Marines to be an astronaut. He was going through his training and it was discovered that he had less than perfect eyesight. So he quit the MC and enrolled into med school in Tennessee to be an eye doctor because he wanted to help people like him to have better eyesight. Well, he couldn't stomach operating on humans, so he left med school and enrolled in veterinarian school. He then went on to say that he got bored of that and he left and moved to AV to go to art school, SCAD. While he was saying all of this, girl was all full of oohs and ahs. Then he tells her of his world travels and that's when it happened. He mentioned a particular country that he had visited that, that girl had also visited, although at different times. A few years prior, there was a bomb set off in a mall there. Girl went on about how when she stayed there, she was at a hotel right next to the mall in question and how it could have been her at the mall. By the way, she was legit distraught over this, albeit a few years removed. And because the bombers were later identified as Muslim terrorists, boys 
went on to tell the craziest thing I have heard that night. He goes on to tell a story about how his cousins were in the same Eastern Bloc country, I can't remember right now, on a mission trip. The whole town comes under attack from, you guessed it, Muslim terrorists. He went on to say that he called his parents and told them what was going on with his cousins and then proceeded to tell a girl that his parents then called in a favor from a friend and had the effing CIA go in and rescue them. I then dropped them at a high-end apartment complex. I honestly felt bad for this girl. I feel like boy, um, you know, Sandra Bullock's grown-up child from Bird Box, apparently. Um, I feel like boy is full of crap from the way this story is being told. I can't quite pick it out. I'm not getting a, a clear picture of the tone here. But he does sound like a bit of a Napoleon Dynamite sort of type, you know what I'm saying? Maybe? I am I reading this right? Either way, I do feel bad for the girl because she seems pretty distraught, but, uh, yeah. Story three. I just dropped off my last passenger for the night at MSP, Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport. As I'm pulling away from the curb, I see a man around my age completely in tears. Especially in a high-traffic area, I'd normally keep on moving to avoid backing up traffic, but he's obviously in distress, and I didn't want to just walk away. I step out to ask him if he's alright, and he's mustering up everything he can to explain his situation through intermittent crying and attempts to breathe. He apparently needs to get to Duluth, Minnesota, two and a half hours away, and no drivers, Uber, Lyft, shuttles, or taxis would accept his fare, especially since it was so late at night. Up to this point in my own life, I had been battling a deep depression, with most days leaving me feeling like I was on the losing end of an endless war, so I felt a great sense of empathy for this guy. All he needed was a little help. I showed him I was an Uber driver, I had the sticker on my car and the driver app, but motioned him to just hop in and that I'll give him a lift, off the books, no charge. He accepted, so we gathered his things, loaded up, and were on our way for a road trip to Duluth. We didn't talk. Didn't need to. An hour in, once he collected himself and NPR started to static out, he asked to borrow my phone, so I obliged. Based on his conversation, he recently lost his wife of several years and their children in a car accident. He then lost his job. He lost his home, and now he was on his way to see his father, who was on his deathbed in Duluth, and had sold everything in his possession to make this trip. We pull up to the address, and while unloading his things, he attempted to hand me whatever money he has left, which I wasn't going to take regardless. But his gesture, which was a sandwich bag full of mixed coins and crumpled bills, let me know how grateful he was in spite of having lost everything. I was just happy to lift a burden off someone else's shoulders, even if only for two and a half hours, and yet we really hadn't spoken up to this point. I went home, hugged my mom, who was asleep on the couch with the TV still on, and felt fortunate that I had an opportunity to lend a helping hand to someone who needed it. Honestly, that is really awesome that you were able to do that out of the kindness of your heart, and I genuinely believe that that is something that is going to stick with that person. They are going to remember that act of kindness for the rest of their life, and you might have made a huge impact on his future. So that's awesome. And even if you didn't, I think you did not just the right thing, but something that was out of your way and really generous. So, good for you. Also, awesome that this story's in Minnesota, because that's where I live, and Duluth is an awesome place, typically. Story 4. I do Uber as a side gig here and there, mostly the late night shift, and I start my evenings in a bar district, usually the one near the private university. Some favorites, the 20-something girl that said nothing but pancakes, pronounced pancakes, again and again the entire ride. Her less drunk friend kept apologizing to her. The gal I dropped off at what I think was a rave. She kept telling me about how fun it was and that a bunch of the gals ended up topless last time. I did not want to see her topless. The couple that, as they were getting in the car, were trying to get another gal to come home with them. The guy kept talking about how he wanted that sweet bud. It was at the end of the night, so I obliged a Whataburger fast food stop. Car in front of us had a puking passenger. My passengers started yelling at them, and they almost got in a fight. The couple that's fallen in love for the night. I'm pretty sure they were doing the nasty in the back seat. I only asked them to not make a mess. They didn't. The gal, probably S-worker, I picked up from one cut-rate hotel, this was on my commute, I work in a crap part of town, and dropped off at another. She made a phone call that I only assume was to the next John. Kept saying, baby, and I can't wait to see you. 
plenty of penis size and intercourse conversations they mostly blur together, the group of early 20-somethings having a conversation about how one of them would have slept with a particular guy if he hadn't been so damn pushy. Dude, chill out. No one gets laid by demanding it. Story 5. Women always talk about D sizes to their girlfriends. From what I gather, anything below 5 inches is too small and over 8 is scary. So if you are between that 5 to 8 range, you're fine. Divorced men, what moment with your former wife made you think, yep, I'm asking this girl to divorce me? Story 1. Not me, but one of my best friends got his permission to post. He got a pretty substantial year-end bonus from work. He decided to use most of it for his wife's Christmas gift and pay off her remaining student loans, $14,700, and the remaining portion to buy a new computer chair for when he gambled, $300. Christmas morning, he was nice enough to let me stay at his place when I traveled for work as he lived 20 minutes from the airport. We all woke up and had breakfast. His family and her parents came over and we started exchanging gifts. Besides paying off her loans, he had gotten her items a few times. She opened the card saying her loans were paid off. She just sat there for a minute. After the silence and assuming she was kinda in shock, she said, Did you seriously not me get me anything else? I bought you that stupid keyboard, the wrong one by the way, and you only got me a few things? At that point, his brother-in-law and myself decided to go hang out in another room for a while. They ended up getting into a huge fight. A day later, when he was dropping me off at the airport, he told me that he was going to visit a lawyer and get a divorce. That is, first off, heartbreaking for your friend, and second, he paid off almost 15 thousand dollars worth of student loan debt and she was snippy about it and snarky that is unbelievable like i i like i believe it but i wish it was unbelievable i guess i don't know just don't be that pe don't be that person folks that's an amazing gift that i would be sobbing in tears and like hugging them and uncontrollable, filled with joy, losing my mind if someone paid off my student loans. Good God. Story two. During the last year and a half of our marriage, she became extremely psychologically abusive. She was a narcissist, controlled my every move, would isolate me, refuse physical contact. I was just an extension to her life, was not allowed to talk to any female, was not allowed to hang out with any friends, or she would ignore me for up to five days at a time. Double standards everywhere. Verbal abuse and the list can continue, but it hurts to think about. The last straw for me was when she threatened to kill me because I came home from work late even though she knew I would be home late. It was just a little too late for her and she also threatened to hit me the same day. This was the second time this happened and I talked with several people at work about it and they suggested that I run. I had texts of the threats on my phone and contacted a lawyer that same week. She agreed to sign since I told her I, it would, I would take severe legal action if she didn't. Thankfully, no children and it was a clean divorce and I'm happily divorced. Holy crap, dude. Clearly, I found that story <laughs> very moving and it brought me to tears. And it's not, you know, my throat being dried out or anything like that. But also... Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah, folks, if you're in a nasty, abusive relationship and abuse comes in all kinds of forms, it may be a good idea to get some distance. Story three. I endured a physically, emotionally, and mentally abusive relationship for over six years with my first wife, four of which we were married. There were many, many instances that should have caused our marriage's demise. The proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, though, was eight days after I had major oral surgery. Due to a freak medical occurrence, I had to have 28 teeth cut out and two holes drilled into my sinus cavities from top of the back of my gums. She and I were in a grocery store parking lot, and I asked her to not start an argument in the store because it's a small town and I was so tired of being those people. Her reaction was to backhand me in the mouth six times. Or at least I counted six times because I'm pretty dang sure I lost consciousness. I just remember waking up when we were pulling into our driveway while she's freaking out because my face is against the window and blood is coming from my mouth like a fountain. Story 4. 
My wife was around less and less, had to be free to live her life, go out with her friends. More often than not, she would call me to pick up our daughter from daycare after promising to pick her up and have some girl time. Just tell her I'm working late or not feeling well. She always had something better to do, and kids were old enough to know better. I went to pick our daughter up one day. When they called her name, she came running over until she saw it wasn't mom, again slumped her shoulders and slowly walked over to ask, what's her excuse this time? That was the breaking point. Told her to get out. Even helped pay her security deposit to get her out. Story 5. When, after being in Afghanistan for eight months, May 02 to November 02, she was missing, had my car, finding two random women with kids and pets living in the apartment I paid for, the electricity cut off, no money in my bank account, a pay advance authorized by my commander, and a friend telling me to go easy on her because she was five months pregnant with his kid. Oh, and he had heart surgery to remove some kind of cyst from his heart just before I left. He was 23, had a pacemaker, and basically half a heart. If I scared him, he could die. I'd say that was the moment. I hope you snuck up behind him and popped an inflated paper bag real aggressive-like. Story 6. We flew across the country for her sister's wedding. She didn't say a word to me the entire time since we had parked at the airport. Once we landed at our destination, we walked a baggage claim, absolute silence proceedings for several hours now. At the carousel, I picked up her bag when she took it out of my hand and calmly stated, None of my family knows you're here. I told them I came alone. She walked out of the airport and left me there. Narcissistic personality disorder made for some really fun scenarios. Oh man, I would have crashed the absolute frick out of that wedding, because honestly, unless the rest of the family already sees through her bull crap, They'd be on her side over yours. You know, folks, I feel like I've uh, made uh, made it pretty clear where I stand on one of the most important things in a relationship. Communication. It's one of the most important things. Clear communication, which leads to understanding and all that other stuff. And if there's one example of not communicating in a relationship, it's this story. You went across the country or whatever, and then it's like, as you get there... Family doesn't know you're here. I told them I came alone. What? Story 7. I used to love to do chores for her because she loved being taken care of. When she stopped noticing, it started hurting. Then one day I made a bench for our entryway out of Barnwood. It took about 40 hours of work. She walked into the house after work that day and sat her purse on it and proceeded to start the fight where she told me that she was mad she got married to me. She stormed out of the house grabbing her purse. Never noticed the bench was there. I knew then, but I think she already knew. This post hit me. I feel so used in my relationship, but just cannot leave because of my three-year-old son. Story 8. When she staged a robbery of our house so she could pawn all of my crap for drug money. Story 9. I was a Lance Corporal bringing home scraps for a paycheck to an unemployed wife who one day brought home a brand new Lexus IS350 because she got a good deal on it. Apparently I was supposed to pay the $800 a month bill. I didn't think it was a good deal. Story 10. When my buddies approached me to complain that she kept sitting on their laps wiggling and hoping for an erection. You have some good buddies, man. Story 11. When she falsely told our marriage counselor that I punched her. The next week, she denied saying it and accused our counselor of lying. He gave me a you-should-leave-this-relationship look. I took that look as permission from a professional that I definitely wasn't making the wrong decision. Got divorced and never looked back. I legitimately feared for my safety towards the end. Not that she would hurt me, but that she would make a false accusation to the cops or a crazy friend. This makes me wonder, are marriage counselors allowed to be a witness in a divorce trial? Oh, yeah, folks, lying like that so to the marriage counselor of all people. But yeah, treating someone like that, it's a form of abuse. That's not something that you should have to put up with. And, you know, good for this person, you know, good for them trying to do marriage counseling and trying to work it out. But yeah, there there comes a point where you should get out of there because, yeah, she could have taken things too far and accused him of even worse things if she was willing to say something like that to a marriage counselor. You gotta protect yourselves. Story 12. She let me know she was pregnant and wanted my permission to tell all her girlfriends during a girl's night out. 
Since I knew there was no possible way it was my child, she was also unknowingly admitting to having an affair. I can do math, and she can't. It was with her boss. Lawyered up the next day, and he ate her alive in court. I got primary custody of our child we already had, and child support, and a sheriff's notice that she had to vacate my home in 30 days. I never knew she could be that stupid. Story 13. When a friend's wife said to me, You know your wife is sleeping with my husband. That's a pickup line if I ever knew one. Story 14. The morning I saw a picture of some dudes doing it on her phone. She was classy enough to bring him the divorce proceedings. Your Honor, I would like to present Exhibit S as evidence. What are some things that guys misinterpret from women as, She's interested in me. Story 1. I was 16 and working at a horse barn. One of the ultra-rich ladies had a houseboy, that's what she actually called him, oh my god, that would come and assist her at the barn with whatever she needed. His car wouldn't start one day. I offered to give him a jump, but it didn't work because there was something else wrong with the car. Oh well, that's the end, right? He started calling every day, first to thank me for being so nice, then just to talk. I would get off the phone as soon as I could, but I didn't want to be rude, right? He asked me how old I was. I told him the truth, that I was 16, thinking that would set him straight. It didn't, and he cheerfully told me he was in his mid-30s. It was with a tone of like, oh, you like chocolate? Well, I like vanilla. Isn't it funny that we're different, you get along so well? Effing yikes. He kept asking me out on dates. I would try and politely refuse. Again, I don't want to be rude, do I? I kept emphasizing I was still in high school and had little time for dates. He asked me if he could take me to prom. I started to get scared then. I couldn't for the life of me figure out why these mid-30s guys wanted to be with a 16-year-old loser with a curfew. Wouldn't older women who didn't live with their parents be much more appealing? Ugh, but he kept calling. Finally, one day, the phone rang, and a lot of the rich horse ladies were there, and they saw me panic, and I could tell, and could tell something was up. I told them what was up. I will never forget this one woman marched over to the phone. It was that dude. She gave him the most epic scolding. Then she contacted security. This place was very fancy with security gates and had him banned from the premises. She also followed up with the lady who he was working for and told her all about it. After she got off the phone with him, she sat me down and gave me a serious talk about how to handle this crap in the future. That has served me very well in life. I really appreciate those rich horse ladies for teaching me how to stand up for myself. First off, dude in your mid-30s. Gross. Just friggin' gross. Don't. Oh my dear lord. And second, yes, unfortunately, ladies, sometimes you have to learn how to stand up for yourselves and draw hard lines because apparently, even if you're not giving any indication that you want things to go further... Some guys are just going to keep pushing uh, until you beat them away with a shovel to the face. Don't actually hit someone. It's a metaphorical shovel. But, uh, yeah, stay safe. Story 2. This story is so bizarre when I tell people it. I feel like they don't actually believe me, but here goes. When I was cocktail waitressing in college, a group of middle-aged men came in. They were seated in a section that wasn't busy, and they were pretty much the only table. Another waitress passed them on to me because she was leaving because her section was dead. I greet the guys. They were on their third bottle of Grey Goose, being loud and having a good time. I was chit-chatting with them when they started to compliment me. They thought I was flirting with them and started getting suggestive, and I kept being polite and trying to get to my other tables, so I thanked them and started to leave. But the guy put a $100 bill on my tray for me if I showed him my bra. I said, absolutely not. Then he kept putting more and more hundreds on the tray while his friends were laughing and demanding more for the money until the amount was up to $1,000. He said, you can walk away with this money if you go to the other side of the bar and lift your shirt to show your bra and cover your face. I was so angry. I told them off, threw the money on the table, and told them I was going to get the manager and they were cut off. Then the other man, next to the one who tried to give the money, then chided me, saying I was young and flirty, and how I was turning down a big opportunity to be this man's friend, and that it could lead to more money and I'd be taken care of. And it was so insulting and rude of me to tell him no, and what a lost opportunity. 
I told him he was rude. I was there paying my way through college. I didn't want their money or to be someone's mistress and that I was no longer going to serve them. I told my manager and she just laughed and called them jerks. That's it. All because I was trying to do my job, I apparently came across as wanting to be a middle-aged man's mistress. I was so angry I left soon after. Folks, if someone is doing a job where part of that job is to be polite to you, then don't take stuff that they do to be flirting unless they are extremely overt. Like, hey, are you doing anything later? Here's my number. Stuff like that. Otherwise, don't just assume, oh, this person's being nice to me. Show me your bra. Like, that's gross. Just a little bit of common sense. I know they were drunk, and so they probably weren't in the best mind, but if they're that drunk, that, that still doesn't excuse their behavior. They're still being absolute creeps. Story three, women service sector workers being friendly to them in the course of doing their jobs. Oh, hey, it, it's, just, it's that thing that I just talked about. Huh. Story four. I remember reading a post a long while ago about some guy who was having problems booking a plane ticket and used the website's chat feature to try to solve the issue. He became convinced that the woman answering his messages was flirting with him because she used a smiley face emoji and didn't exit the conversation once the issue was resolved. Having worked in places like that, we were told not to be the one to exit the conversation first in case the customer has an additional query that they forgot to mention. This guy missed her and wondered if she was thinking about him too. The answer is, she absolutely is not. Story 5. Being employed in a bar and serving him. Dude, I'm required to be polite. You are older than my dad and I can smell you from here. I do not have a thing for you. Story 6. Accidentally making eye contact on the train. This happened to me. I was standing on the train, staring in front of me, zoning out as you do. This guy, who was in my line of vision, thought I must be staring at him. So he came and stood right in front of me and asked if it was okay for him to stand there, then proceeded to hit on me and boost himself up as to why I should talk to him. I just turned up my music and ignored him. After a few stops of doing this, he got the hint. Also, a creepier thing happened to me on the train while I was traveling with my son. This guy sitting in front of me was smiling at my kid and trying to talk to him. Then he whipped out his phone and started taking pics. As soon as I picked up my phone to take a pic of him, he ran out of the train. People are effing creeps. Story 7. A classmate, G, in college and I met up to peer review for our senior semester three or four times. Years later, I ran into a mutual friend, K, and she said she was so glad that G and I dated or else we, K and I, would never have been friends. I was like, dated? And she was like, yeah, I remember G was always talking about how you guys were dating in the last semester. Story 8. I tried to pay for my coffee. He worked at the coffee stand. I don't know. It was weird. Apparently, being polite whilst ordering my beverage meant it was a green light to try and ask for my number and then lean over the bloody counter and kiss me on the cheek as I was about to walk away. I was 19 at the time and had no clue what was happening. Okay. First off, let's just address the fact that you don't just kiss somebody that you don't know because you think they were flirting. That's, that, I mean, that's, that could be assault. Right? I don't know the law, but that's... don't. And second, can we just stop, like, don't flirt, don't assume that people who are working and are supposed to be courteous are flirting with you, and don't assume that if you're the one doing the customer service, that the customer being nice means that they're flirting with you. Just stop. Let people... can't we just do business in business places? Story 9. If he is really interested in me, then almost anything I do can be misinterpreted. Laughing when they say something funny, being physically close even if it's because we're in a small space with lots of other people and it can't be avoided. Smiling, just like I do to other people. 
just generally being a friendly person. It's just treating them like I treat other guys I'm friends with, but those guys won't take these as signs I'm interested in them because they aren't hoping for signs that I'm interested. Story 10. Everything. I remember a post in here by a guy who thought a woman had chosen a particular color sweater to mirror the one he had worn the day before, and surely it was a sign. There is nothing at all too small to lead someone thirsty to assume it's a sign. I forgot my personal anecdote, so here goes. New roommate when we were in college. The apartment housed five people, and this guy was new after someone dropped out and moved away. We were all hanging out one night and talked with him a bit, joked a bit. Nothing intimate or flirty at all. Later, one of the others told me that he'd asked her to tell me he wasn't into me so I shouldn't get my hopes up. He had claimed I was obviously flirting. I never wanted him, nor liked him much as a person. Teachers and counselors, what's the worst case of helicopter parenting you've ever encountered? Story 1. A student of another colleague. We were sitting around marking papers when he burst into hysterical laughter. Colleague 1. Can anyone make sense of this sentence? It's just, it's not even a thing. This is an anti-thing. He reads it to us. It's half a rant, half eighth grader gibberish. Colleague 2. Oh my god, I just read that exact same thing. She flipped through a stack of papers and pulled it out, compared, and it's basically the exact same paper by the same student submitted to two separate classes. Totally counts as academic dishonesty, and that's explicit in the outline. It has to be original work for the class. The two of them take the papers to their professors. They agree. It goes straight to the department head as a case of plagiarism. Student is completely livid. He's clearly a genius. Everyone else is a moron for even questioning his work, and he'll have our heads and our jobs for this. He schedules a meeting with the department head like he's supposed to, and the day finally comes. In this smug, chubby little sucker struts, fully suited up, and right behind him is Uncle Sleazy Lawyer, complete with matching suit and and briefcase to boot. We can hear the student muttering as he stomps down the hallway about how he's going to be a great legal mind one day, because his uncle told him so and he was totally, totally going to show us all. It was all I could do not to laugh. They go into the office, close the door, and Uncle Lawyer loudly declares for all to hear, my client has prepared a statement before we begin. Department head, no. Student, but it's my right. Department head, no. Student, B but department head, no. We couldn't hear anything after that. We had to close our own door so we could laugh. He was disciplined appropriately, though. All the professors knew who that student was from that point on. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that's necessarily helicopter parenting so much as it's helicopter uncling, but uh, <laughs> that's funny. I mean... If it's in the rules, if it's explicitly stated in the outline, what are you trying to argue? You have to make it, you know, specifically for that class. I don't know. That, I mean, that kid seriously needs to gain just a little bit of humbleness. Story two. Real helicopter parents get into positions of power where they can directly influence their kids' lives. My mom got a place on the board of my sister's small private high school and managed to put a second family member on the board as well. This gave her a lot of sway in hiring and firing teachers. One teacher was fired for, among other things, using big words like pedagogical at school board meetings. Who even knows what that means, am I right? All the teachers would tell my mom how great her daughter was. Great kid, always improving. Fast forward to college, my sister had a failing average each semester for three semesters. She nearly got expelled for copy-pasting a Wikipedia entry on an exam, then denying it. She even managed to fail her physics class, where the mark was based on attendance. My parents elected not to send her back for a fourth semester. How could such a thing happen? How could a great high school student do so poorly in college? It turns out that, quite understandably, none of the high school teachers wanted to risk their jobs to tell my mom that her kid probably had a serious learning disability. This, despite the fact that my sister's disability was obvious to anyone who tried to help her with homework for more than five minutes. 
After a bad semester in college, my sister was finally diagnosed with a learning disability, though the help couldn't come fast enough for her to turn her college career around. Had it not been for my mom's hovering in high school, the teachers might have been straight with my parents, and maybe my sister would have gotten help sooner. This right here is one of many reasons why helicopter parenting is a bad thing, especially if you are helicopter parenting to the degree that you're basically threatening their teachers and the people who are supposed to be helping them. Like, that's ridiculous. This poor girl could have gotten help sooner and might have turned out to be a much better student and had a better time, but because her mom was this just awful force like this, Instead of her mom helping her like she wanted to, she has hindered her daughter's life. Story 3. Currently a teacher, but my story comes from my days as a college student. My university offered a day-long parent orientation as an option for parents while their kids were attending their own two-day student orientation session. The summer before my senior year, I was hired as a student employee for this parent orientation session. Steady hours, good pay, etc. A pretty nice summer gig for a poor college student. Anyway, we met a wide range of parents at the registration table. Some of the parents were obviously not too worried. Is local bar still open? I'd love to duck out and get some nostalgia beers. Others were clearly interested without being too overbearing. I've got a few questions about class registration. Can you point me in the right direction? But the parents that I'll always remember, wow. Part of the script we were supposed to go over involved asking parents if they would be interested in taking a tour of their student's future dormitory. When I got to this part of the script with one mom, she completely broke down, started bawling and crying about how she wasn't ready for her little angel to go off to college. This went on for several minutes and bordered on a full-on tantrum. Mind you, this wasn't on move-in day. It was at an orientation two freaking months before school actually started. I shudder to think how the actual move-in day went for that family. Story 4. My parents are helicopter parents. My stepmom was insane while the six of us kids were in school. She had access to every assignment, due date, date it was turned in, and grade we received. My teachers hated her. She would call about grades lower than a B. Once I ordered a letterman jacket, and when I was told the price, I called my stepmom and she demanded to speak to the people selling them and told them we were poor but deserved the same privileges as everyone else. On speaker. It was so embarrassing. I was on a reduced lunch and one day I couldn't eat because my money ran out. Guess what happened? Q2 crying lunch ladies and a burnt grilled cheese. I felt so bad. My dad would go to every meet the teacher night and insult the level of intelligence of every math teacher. He demanded I go to tutoring and he called my teachers to make sure I was there every morning. He even made me get their signature to prove I was there. He went with me to my community college orientation and followed me from class to class making sure he knew where each one was and he got the phone numbers and emails from all my professors. Growing up with them was a nightmare. He would yell and shout and throw fits like a toddler, and my teachers would always feel sorry for me because that's what I went home to. Eventually, my dad demanded I pay rent while working three jobs and going to college full-time. I got kicked out because I got a tattoo. I was 19, met a guy, and moved in with him. That really peed off my parents, and now we are happily married. Our one-year wedding anniversary is tomorrow. Yay, overbearing parents. <sighs> Helicopter parents. There are typically two most likely outcomes that are going to happen if you are this close and in control of your child's life and this oppressive. Either one, that child is going to become so completely dependent on you and unable to face the world without you that basically they're your child for your entire life and you're going to have to take care of them and they're going to struggle. Or two... Your child, the moment that they are an adult and can get out from under your control, are going to run as far from you as possible because of how oppressive you are, and they'll want nothing to do with you, and it'll be really hard to earn that trust back. I don't think either option sounds very good, so maybe the better option is to not pressure them like that. Story 5. In high school, I became really good friends with this kid named Dan. Dan and I hung out a ton, and one weekend I invited him over for a sleepover, stay up late watching TV and play video games. 
I had to meet his mother and his father to gain approval. It was like going through a job interview. Had to tell them where I wanted to go to college, my life's goals, etc. Got the approval and Dan was allowed to sleep over my house. The morning after the night of the sleepover, my mom gets a call at 6 a.m. Hi, this is Dan's mom. Are you watching your child and my boy? My mom quickly gets over the shock and replies, yes, they're downstairs in the basement and they're fine. We have a finished room where we would always hang out. Well, I would appreciate you checking on them because I haven't heard from Dan all night. My mom woke us up and Dan realized he left his cell phone upstairs. He goes to get it and it turns out he has 63 missed calls, 105 mixed test messages, and 20 voicemails. What? <laughs> He started to cry, and my mom just hugged him and said it was okay and made us breakfast. Story 6 I worked as a college ambassador during undergrad. Part of this meant I ended up at events with prospective students and their families to tell them about all of the great things we did. This was a fancy one where there was dinner served and we were assigned to a different table with two to three families. I always try to talk to the kids and try to connect with them, but this kid, we'll call him Brad, was the hardest case I've ever had. Every time I would talk to him, he would make eye contact with me, then look at his mom. She would answer every question I could ask. What's your favorite class? What are you looking forward to the most? All were answered by mom. Then, of course, because Brad wasn't asking me any questions, she decided to start asking me questions about my college experience. This was when she told me of his life plans. He too was going to be a resident advisor in college, and he was going to graduate in three years so he could go to med school at Harvard. And he was going to get married too, high school girlfriend's name before med school started. You could see the kid just try to shrink away. What's your customer's dumbest complaint? Viewers edition. Story one. A few years back, I worked the register at this rather famous surf shop. To be fair, a lot of customers here were just straight up mean or entitled. The front counter displayed all these really nice watches, easily costing around 1000 each. One day, I was helping this woman pick out a watch for at least a solid five minutes. She was holding them, comparing them, looking at all the details, etc. Again, she couldn't make up her mind. She seemed nice enough, though, at first. This spot was a well-known hotspot for shoplifters, and the desk I was at was about 10 feet from the door. Eventually, I got a rush of customers. I tried calling for backup on my store radio, but no one came. Therefore, I calmly and kindly explained the situation to this woman, telling her I'll need to put the watches back in their cases and behind the counter so no one could steal them. I don't explicitly say she would steal them, just that anyone could take them. And I would be back with her in about five minutes or so. I'll never forget the dead-eyed, blank stare she gave me. She just gave me a look that screamed, How dare you? A few minutes pass and I see her talking with my manager as she's pointing at me. I'm still helping, helping customers at this point, again, by myself. Eventually I get through the rush and I see this woman letting her kid run around the store as she's just staring daggers at me. I motion for her back to my counter, but she won't budge. Eventually I see my manager walk to me and she and her kid storm out. I tell her to have a nice day and she doesn't respond. Shift manager calls me into his office and gives me a huge lecture how I apparently refused to help this woman and I wouldn't let her look at the watches as she completely disregarded the five minutes I gave her at least. This woman straight up told this elaborate lie to my manager and of course he took the bait. Like, oh ma'am, I'm sorry I won't let you hold and wear out every very expensive watches while my back is turned and the exit is literally right there. I tried explaining my case, but my manager wasn't having it. I ended up getting not one, but two write-ups for my attitude. I did eventually get fired for a completely different reason, which is also really dumb. But the good news is that the store eventually shut down. Good. That place sucked, and the customers were absolute human garbage. Screw you, Daniel. I guess karma really is a B. I absolutely hate when managers think better of customers than their own employees. You're hiring those employees to represent you. You're putting trust in them. And then when some crappy customer says something about your employee, you immediately just take their side. Like I get taking their side maybe in front of them just to de-escalate a situation. And then once the customer leaves, be like, don't worry, you did nothing wrong. I just wanted to get that person out of here. 
But to be like that behind closed doors, yeah, screw those people. That's just a crappy way of managing. Have some faith in your employees. Story 2. I worked at a truck stop for eight years. I don't have the time to go into how many stupid questions I was asked, so let me just highlight a few of my favorites. Someone once asked me when our Friday fish special was. I was asked what bagged milk was and why we put it in bags. We're in the upper Midwest. I don't know, man. It's just a thing we do. How long do the whole chickens take to cook? One hour. Can I have one now? Sure, but it'll take an hour to make. Why can't I just have one now? Wasn't so much a question, but I had to stop someone and explain to them why they couldn't just take a slice of pizza out of a whole pie on our hotspot unit. The pies were sold as whole pies, and the slices were sold separately on a different shelf. If what you wanted wasn't there, we could make it. This lady just wanted to take one slice from a pizza a advertised as a whole pie and didn't understand why that would cause problems. Again, not so much a question, but a woman frantically waved me down to inform me that our gas pumps outside smelled like gas. She was worried there was a leak, which is fair, but I had to explain how gas stations do smell like gas quite frequently. My favorite was during power outages when we had to close the store, lock the doors, and put signs on the windows stating the store was out of power and we were closed. Customers would constantly walk up to the doors, pull on them, look confused, pull a dozen more times, peer inside, step back, finally read the sign, then bang on the doors to get our attention. When we'd answer, they'd ask if we were out of power. Then they'd ask if it'd be alright if they came in and bought something. No! We don't have power! I got cash! Great! I have no means of processing that cash. Well, I only want a cup of coffee. Again! We have no power! We have no coffee made! Then they'd scoff at us as if we just insulted their honor and leave, taking to... threatening to take their business elsewhere. Wouldn't you know it, they'd be back the next day to get their coffee. First off, yeah, that is absolutely what so many people will do, so many more than you would think, when you have to close up a store because of a power outage or just some issue where you can't have customers in, they will never just grab and pull the door and be like, oh, it's locked. They always pull, go, huh, and they're like, bruh, 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 bruh. like, some of them will go absolutely wild and it's like, hey, bud, take a hint. <laughs> and yeah, people are, oh, I've got cash, this and that. It's like, there are actual systems and stuff these days, old folks. I know, it's stupid. Technology doesn't make things the best sometimes, but that's the way it is. And none of these people who are making minimum wage working at these places want to risk their job to get you a Snickers bar. Story 3. I'm a waitress. Once a customer ordered online with food being mildly spicy and called back to complain that it's too spicy. Well, I offered to remake it for her and let her know that we'll make it not spicy. She complained that our website doesn't have a choice to order something not spicy. And since she has to waste time driving to our place and drive back home, it'll be like 30 minutes until she can eat and we should offer her another free food after today as well. We hung up and I checked the website, found a not spicy choice if you scroll down. So when she came to pick up her free food, I just kindly let her know and she just left quietly. Second story, several people like to come into our restaurant and ask to use the restroom without being our customer. Some people just lied, asked to take a look at the menu while they excused themselves to use the restroom or let their friend using the restroom came out and just left. I understand that sometimes it's hard or urgent when I need a restroom, but it's way too often for people coming in to use the restroom. My owner put stickers for no public restroom for years in the front door, but nobody seemed to care. If it happened once in a while, I can let a few people use it. I once got ladies coming in just to use the restroom. When they came out, I asked if they'd like to buy something from us and let them know we don't have a public restroom. They said no and were kind of rude and angry, saying that they're not even from here and will never come back to our place. And even taking a photo of our front door slash name of restaurant to maybe complain online, but whatever, the owner is always cool and understands employees. Sometimes I just wonder if people realize that we're not only the ones cleaning without you being my customer, but the restaurant also has to pay for water, electricity, trash bags, towels, etc. You know, even if you just buy a single drink, I'll mark you as a customer and you can freely use the restroom to your heart's content. Just don't make a mess. 
Story 4. I worked at a corporate pizza chain and was working the takeout counter. This was during the height of COVID and the whole mask mandate, and restaurants had to reset their seating and carryout policies. Well, I was working one night and got a call from a guy who was waiting in one of the curbside pickup spots for his order. I asked for the name on the order, and he told me his name. I looked through all the tickets behind me and didn't see his name or any ticket resembling what he had ordered. So I calmly told him that I wasn't able to find his order and asked him if it was possible he called a different location and they had his order. Nope, this guy was adamant that his order was at our location. I asked the gentleman if he could give me a minute to check the point of sale and deal with a couple of people in line. I hung up to help the two or three customers and got back to finding the ticket, but once again didn't find it and asked for my manager to take a look on their end. The manager tells us that we didn't have his ticket. I went to the parking lot to find where the guy was parked, and he was in a different section of the parking lot that wasn't in our designated spot. I get to his car with a mask and gloves on, and I'm standing a good four feet away from the car. He cracks open the window, not even three inches, and I try to explain to him the situation. He doesn't listen, and insisted that we screwed up. I wasn't in the mood to argue, so I went back inside to double-check the orders again. Still no ticket, and my manager is handling the takeout counter. We talk, and I go back outside and return to the man in his car and asked him if he wanted to just place a new order with us. At this point, this guy is being a paranoid jerk and refuses to talk to me so we could resolve the situation. I go back inside and tell my manager again what happened, and this time she decides to go out and speak to him. I wait inside, continuing to help the rest of the customers in line, and the manager walks back and she is just bewildered by how insane and disrespectful this guy was. After that, nothing happens and the evening goes on without any other incidents. I get to work the next day, and my general manager is there. I wait to get checked in, and he tells me that a formal complaint was made against me by the guy in his car saying that I was the one being disrespectful, and not wearing gloves and mask and violating the COVID protocols. I'm completely blown away by this, and try to tell the GM what really happened, and that the manager from yesterday would agree with me. The GM just wants to drop the whole thing and give me a lecture on how important the protocols were. So I clock in, and I'm not happy about the whole thing, but did my best to hide my frustration. And during mid-shift, the manager who was working the previous shift with me showed up for her shift, and I told her what happened. The next thing I know, she goes back to the office where the GM was and tells him the exact same story I told the GM about the situation. So yeah, that's my crappy complaint made by a customer. You know, I personally do love how much technology has made like ordering food so much easier and by easier i of course mean me having to interact with other human beings as little as possible i'm good with these apps i can get on there order my stuff put in my special instructions all that stuff so much faster than if i had to go in and muster up the courage to deal with a human being but as much as i do love these i feel so bad for all of the employees for restaurants that take this stuff, because I know that only maybe two thirds of their customers are like me, where they can actually manage the app and do stuff right. The other third are mostly older people who don't know how to use that technology, which is understandable. I'm gonna get to the point where I can't keep up with it too. It happens to everyone, but man, that's gonna make their lives so much harder and I don't have a solution, just some sympathy. Sorry. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.